Hello everyone and welcome to NSBA's Night School, Introduction to Steel Bridge Design. Today is June 13, 2016, and this is Session 2, Introduction and History of AASHTO LRFD Bridge Design Specifications, presented by Michael Grubb. My name is Christina Harbour, and I am with AISC's Continuing Education Group. I will be moderating today's presentation. I want to introduce today's speaker. Michael Grubb has approximately 37 years of experience related to steel bridge design and specifications. Mike is currently a self-employed consultant with M.A. Grubb & Associates. Mike has worked previously at the U.S. Steel Research Laboratory for AISC Marketing, for HDR Engineering, and for BSDI Limited. Over his career, Mike has been involved in the development of inelastic design procedures for steel bridges, computer software and design aids, straight and curved steel bridge research, development and delivery of training courses on steel bridge design, and updating the national design specifications for steel bridges, including LRFD. Welcome, Mike, and I'll let you take it from here. Thanks, Christina. Hello, everyone, and welcome once again to the AISC Night School course, Introduction to Steel Bridge Design. This session is the second of eight separate sessions in this, in this Night School introductory course. Last Monday was session one, Introduction to Bridge Engineering. This particular session is session number two, entitled Introduction and History of the AASHTO LRFD Bridge Design Specifications. This session will begin with a historical background on the inception and evolution of the AASHTO Bridge Design Specifications. The major improvements to the specifications at each step will be highlighted, along with the processes and procedures that are employed to update and maintain the specifications. Other bridge specifications of note will also be mentioned as part of this first topic to be covered. Then we will move on to discuss the evolution of the various design methodologies in the AASHTO specifications, from the earlier allowable stress design and load factor design methodologies, up to the present day load and resistance factor design methodology. Included at the end of this topic will be a basic comparison of the AISC and AASHTO design specifications. Lastly, a broad overview of the present day load and resistance factor design specifications will be provided, primarily focused on section six of the bridge specification on steel structures. The various limit states and the associated behaviors of concern at each limit state for different types of members used in steel bridges will be discussed. Important design issues related to skewed and horizontally curved steel bridges will also be briefly reviewed. So let's get this session started first with an overview of the history of the AASHTO bridge design specifications, from the earliest versions of the standard specifications for highway bridges, up through the current load and resistance factor design specifications. Early bridge design specifications began to appear around the 1870s and were primarily developed by individual engineers and railroad companies. Early bridges carried rail and canal traffic and, to a limited extent, horse-drawn traffic and pedestrians. The business model for these early bridges was essentially design-build. Proof of the adequacy of the design was usually obtained by test-loading the bridge. There was little in the way of coordinated design specifications for these early bridges except those developed by the builders themselves that conformed to the spans and loads for that particular bridge. In 1874, the Eads Bridge was constructed over the Mississippi River in St. Louis and was the first large bridge to span the river and the first to carry railroad tracks. The Eads Bridge was also the first alloy steel bridge, the first to use tubular cord members, the first to entirely depend on cantilever construction of the superstructure, and the first to use pneumatic caissons in the construction of the piers. The bridge was essentially a masonry arch done in steel. The design of this historic bridge started with the development of the required material properties and design specifications that were necessary for the design and construction of such a large steel bridge. On December 12, 1914, the American Association of State Highway Officials, or ASHO, was founded. 
ASHO was set up as a non-governmental organization whose purpose was to coordinate transportation activities amongst the various state departments of transportation. The association has since evolved into a standard-setting body that publishes specifications, test protocols, and guidelines used in highway design and construction in the U.S. The association now also represents not only highway, but also air, rail, water, and public transportation as well. The name of the organization was changed to AASHTO on November 13, 1973. That is, the word transportation was added to the name to reflect the organization's broader scope covering all modes of transportation, although most of its activities are still specific to highways. The first ASHO specifications to appear in published form were the 1931 first edition specifications. The specifications were printed in a hardcover format, and the first edition had a total of about 200 pages and was just over a half inch thick. Contrast that with today's LRFD specification, which is over a thousand pages long and about four and a half inches thick. The first edition was titled the Standard Specifications for Highway Bridges and Incidental Structures and quickly became the de facto national standard. Rather early on, the last three words of the original title were dropped and the specification has since been reissued in 16 subsequent editions published in three to six, years, six year intervals in the years shown to incorporate any new developments resulting from research, to clarify the specifications as needed, or to correct any errors. The last hardcover edition was the 11th edition printed in 1973. The last published edition of the standard specifications was the 17th edition published in 2002. Unlike the current LRFD specifications, all versions of the standard specifications had no commentary provided. As the years passed into the decades of the 40s, 50s, and 60s, significant developments included the application of composite construction to bridges. The earliest patents related to composite construction date to the 1880s and generally related to what were called concrete encased beams. Thus, engineers were aware of composite behavior, but did not really take advantage of it in bridge design. The first patent related to composite highway bridges can be traced back to 1926. Modern composite design procedures can be traced back to the 1957 edition of the ASHO specifications. Only simple spans were addressed for many years. Shorter spans utilizing multiple stringer rolled shapes supporting the deck were the first to be adapted to composite design. The use of shallower stringers on bridges with concrete decks started to become acceptable. In the early 1950s, it became evident that wide flange beams with span to depth ratios greater than 25 could be economical with the increasing use of multiple stringers and composite decks. As a result, the recommended span to depth ratio was relaxed to 30 for the steel section and left at 25 for the composite section. In the third edition ASHO specification, dated 1941, a live load deflection limit was introduced for the first time to ensure what was thought to be proper performance. Bridges were limited to a maximum live load deflection of the span length divided by 800. The use of continuous spans was not common until the 1960s when computer programs made analysis of these structures more practical. The use of continuous spans complicated the application of some of the relatively straightforward rules that existed for many years for simple spans. Interpretation has often been left up to the owner and the engineer, resulting in a wide range of approaches. Along with the federalization of the highway system came a major federal commitment to fund university research. Bridge research quickly became a part of the overall research program. One of the more significant bridge research projects was the ASHO road test conducted on an outdoor test facility in Ottawa, Illinois in the late 1950s and early 1960s. The project was sponsored by ASHO and administered and directed by the Highway Research Board, 
with the approval of its parent organization, the National Academy of Sciences. Early planning for the road test contemplated only pavement testing. In December 1951, the scope of the project was expanded at the request of the ASHO Committee on Bridges and Structures to include several test bridge spans in the test track loops. The goals of the bridge test were to determine the behavior of certain short span highway bridges under repeated application of overstress and to determine the dynamic effects of moving vehicles on short span highway bridges. There were 10 steel roll beam bridges and eight pre-stressed and reinforced concrete bridges located in two of the four major test track loops. Each bridge was a simple span structure with a span of 50 feet consisting of three beams and a reinforced concrete slab. Eight of the steel beam bridges were non-composite and two were made composite by connecting the beams to the deck with channel shear connectors. Seven of the bridges had welded partial length cover plates. The construction of the bridges on the test loops started in the fall of 1956 and testing began in 1958. All tests were completed by the middle of June 1961. The bridges were subjected to repeated trips of tractor semi-trailers loaded to specified axle weights, covering a range from 22,400 pounds to 48,000 pounds. Both single and tandem axle vehicles were included. One of the more significant items for steel bridges to come out of the ASHO road test was the establishment of the base stress limits of 0.95 FY for composite sections and 0.80 FY for non-composite sections that are still in force today at the service limit state. The steel bridges in the road test were subjected to more than 390,000 vehicle passages, which is equivalent to 20 overload crossings every day for more than 50 years. The total accumulated permanent sets at mid-span measured at the end of the test traffic are plotted for six of the steel bridges in the figure shown here. At stresses approaching 90% of FY, the yield strength FY, the permanent set was relatively low in composite bridge 2B as compared to non-composite bridge 3A. On the basis of this test data, the stress limits were set as shown. Note that at the two limiting stress conditions, the measured permanent sets in the non-composite and composite bridges were of approximately the same magnitude, approximately one inch. Today, much of the bridge research in the U.S. is currently coordinated and administered under the auspices of the National Cooperative Highway Research Program, or NCHRP. The NCHRP is administered by the Transportation Research Board, or TRB, and sponsored by the member departments of AASHTO in cooperation with the Federal Highway Administration, or FHWA. It should be mentioned that the FHWA also conducts and administers separate bridge-related research projects. Support for the NCHRP is voluntary and funds are drawn from the state's federal aid highway apportionment of state planning and research funds. Funds can only be spent on problems approved by at least two-thirds of the states. The AASHTO Standing Committee on Research solicits problem statements from AASHTO member transportation departments, the chairs of AASHTO committees and subcommittees, the FHWA, and TRB committees. Selected projects are then conducted by contractors with oversight provided by volunteer panels of expert stakeholders. Research findings are published in NCHRP reports and the NCHRP synthesis of practice series. The results of the research are often directly implemented into the AASHTO specifications. Design provisions for straight composite steel tub girders were first introduced in the 10th edition of the AASHTO standard specifications dated 1969. These provisions were developed as part of a joint effort between the American Iron and Steel Institute and the University of Washington based on analytical work as well as some model tests. The provisions were allowable stress design provisions and applied solely to straight multi-box cross sections. 
Torsion was implicitly considered and recognized in the distribution of live loads, but was thought to be insignificant in the design of the girders based on the parameters covered by the research and limited in the specifications. The capacity of the bottom flange of the box in compression was based on classical plate buckling equations. A special live load distribution factor was developed to assign live load to the individual boxes in the cross section. To ensure that this factor was applied within the limits of the research study from which it was developed, limits were placed on the cross section within the design provisions. A significant development in the history of the specifications occurred with the adoption of the load factor design methodology for steel structures in the 1971 interim specifications. This so-called limit states design approach was introduced as an alternative to the traditional allowable stress design methodology that had existed in the ASHO specifications since the first edition. The approach gives recognition to the significant ductility and reserve strength of steel beyond the elastic range that is not adequately accounted for in ASD. The concrete industry had gone to a limit states design approach for building design in 1963 and later completely eliminated the allowable stress design approach. Recognizing this growing trend, an advisory committee was formed by the American Iron and Steel Institute, or AISI, in 1965 to develop design recommendations for a more consistent and effective use of steel in highway bridges. This study resulted in the publication in 1969 of AISI Bulletin 15 by George Vincent, shown here, entitled Tentative Criteria for Load Factor Design of Steel Highway Bridges, which included criteria for both eye girders and box girders. After some further study and modifications, the tentative criteria were adopted by ASHO in 1970 and published in 1971. Load factor design is a method of proportioning structural members for multiples of the design loads to assure a design allowing the expected number of passages of ordinary vehicles during the life of the structure, occasional passages of, of reasonable overload vehicles without damage, and for an extreme emergency, a few passages of exceptionally heavy overloads with some expected damage. In allowable stress design, attention is focused on performance under service conditions only. Load factor design considers performance in a broader context in that it deals with serviceability and safety separately. The allowable stress and load factor design methodologies will be discussed further later on in this session. In 1978, Ashto adopted a fracture control plan in the aftermath of the Silver Bridge collapse in Point Pleasant, West Virginia in 1967 due to a brittle fracture and some other fractures that had occurred. The plan was prepared jointly by the Ashto Technical Committees on Steel Design and on Welding and the FHWA in consultation with the industry and the Ashto Subcommittee on Materials. The plan was initially adopted as a guide specification, which were complete specifications developed separately from the standard specifications that could optionally be adopted or invoked by the individual states. Currently, the fracture control plan resides solely within the ASHTO D1.5 bridge welding code. The plan places controls on material properties and initial flaw sizes in so-called fracture-critical non-redundant steel bridge members, or FCMs, to provide adequate performance. The plan specifies design and review responsibilities, welding, welded inspector, fabricator, fabricator, and NDT personnel qualification and certification, welding requirements, welding procedures, welding repair procedures, and required fracture toughness of the steel and weld metal. Since the plan has been applied to U.S. bridge construction, there have been no similar failures. In fact, there have been far more sudden collapses of bridges associated with stability failures, particularly during construction, and failures due to scour than due to fracture. Today, with modern materials, fabrication, and current design and analysis provisions, such bridges can easily achieve the same reliability and safety as any other bridge. 
Current research on member level redundancy, system analysis, and the exploitation of the tremendous toughness of modern steels will likely lead to an entire rethinking of how bridges traditionally classified as fracture critical are viewed in the future. Since the 1960s, horizontally curved girder bridges have grown from relative obscurity to comprise a significant portion of the steel bridge market in recent years. The earliest laboratory tests of curved steel girders were performed in the U.S. in the late 1960s and early 1970s by a consortium of university research teams, or CURT team, under the auspices of the FHWA with financial support from 25 participating state highway departments. The CURT team included researchers from Syracuse University, the University of Rhode Island, the University of Pennsylvania, and Carnegie Mellon University. The project encompassed analytical studies and laboratory tests of scaled steel box and eye girders. This work resulted in the development of tentative design specifications for horizontally curved highway bridges in an allowable stress design format, which were adopted by ASHTO in 1976. Specs for both curved steel, eye, and box girder bridges were included. In 1975, the American Iron and Steel Institute initiated Project 190 at Washington University in St. Louis to develop load factor design criteria for curved steel eye and box girder bridges, which were adopted by ASHTO in 1979 and incorporated in the 1980 guide specifications for horizontally curved highway bridges. The guide spec was reissued in 1993 with a number of technical and editorial corrections and clarifications. Staying on the subject of curved bridges, starting in the late 1990s, the NCHRP initiated Project 12-38 to develop an improved revised ASHTO guide specification for horizontally curved bridges in a load factor design format only based on the state-of-the-art knowledge. The work was done by the firm BSDI in conjunction with Auburn University. This work led to the development and acceptance by ASHTO of the 2003 guide specifications for horizontally curved highway bridges. These specifications included construction specifications specific to curved bridges, which had been lacking in the previous versions of the guide spec, as well as two complete design examples illustrating the application of the specifications. In 1986, NCHRP Project 20-7, Task 31, was initiated at the request of ASHTO to investigate the development of a new comprehensive bridge specification with an accompanying commentary. By this time, the ASHTO standard specifications had undergone a number of revisions and had become somewhat disjointed and difficult to use and contained a number of inconsistencies. In addition, commentary language to explain the provisions had never been provided. The firm of Majeski and Masters was selected for the project. The tasks were to review other specifications to compare the overall coverage of topics and the philosophies of safety with the ASHTO specification, to review all of the ASHTO guide documents for possible inclusion in the new specification, to assess the feasibility of a probability-based design specification in order to provide a more measured level of reliability or safety, and to prepare an outline of a revised ASHTO specification. All signs at the time seemed to indicate that most of the developed countries were moving in the direction of a calibrated, probability-based limit state design specification. For example, in 1979, the Ontario Highway Bridge Design Code was released to the design community by the Ontario Ministry of Transportation as North America's first calibrated, reliability-based design specification. The findings of the NCHRP Project 20-7 Task 31 project were presented at the 1997 annual meeting of the AASHTO Standing Committee on Bridges and Structures held in San Diego, California. Seven potential options for a new specification were presented for consideration. In 
As a result of these discussions, AASHTO requested funding to initiate NCHRP Project 12-33 to develop a new modern AASHTO bridge design specification. Again, Majeski and Masters was selected to do the work, and this large effort began in July of 1988. A code coordinating committee was assembled along with an editorial team. A task group was assembled for each section of the specification and for the code calibration. There were a total of 56 task group members. The first draft of the specification was completed in 1990 and provided general coverage. More advanced second and third drafts were completed in 1991 and 92. Along the way, two complete sets of trial designs to exercise the new specification provisions were completed and discussed in 91 and 1992. Finally, the fourth draft of the specification completed in 1993 was adopted by AASHTO. The specification was reviewed by hundreds and over 12,000 comments were received. The first edition AASHTO LRFD specification was printed and made available in 1994. Both customary U.S. units and SI units versions were printed. The red cover was the U.S. units version and the blue was the SI units version. It is important to note that the LRFD specification was initially adopted as a co-equal alternative to the AASHTO standard specifications. That is, it was up to the individual states to decide which specification, the existing standard specs or the new LRFD specs, would be used on a particular project. The first major bridge designed using the new LRFD specification the Blue Water Bridge between the U.S. and Canada was opened to traffic in 1997. Let's now review some of the major changes in the new LRFD specification. First of all, the specification was more comprehensive and considered to be a more technically state-of-the-art specification. For example, design requirements for computing the resistance of a structural member or component were upgraded to the current state-of-the-art. Probably the most obvious and important change was the adoption of a new philosophy of safety, the load and resistance factor design philosophy, initially adopted by AISC in 1986 in their load and resistance factor design specification for structural steel buildings. In this philosophy, which we'll be briefly discuss later on in this session, the desired level of safety is determined through a statistical calibration process. Levels of safety in existing allowable stress and load factor design methodologies were established primarily based on judgment and previous experience. Four limit states were specifically identified in the LRFD specification, which will also be discussed later on in this session. One of the more important advancements was the inclusion of parallel commentary language, which was lacking in the standard specs. The specification was set up in a two-column format with the specification language in the left-hand column and the accompanying commentary language in the right-hand column. The new specification also encouraged a more multidisciplinary approach to bridge design and placed a greater emphasis on the importance of redundancy, ductility, and designing for constructability. Other major changes in the new specification included the adoption of a completely new design live load to replace the so-called H and HS live loadings given in the standard specifications. The new design live load is called HL93 and basically consists of a 72 kip HS20 design truck in combination with a uniform design lane load of 640 pounds per foot. The previous H and HS live loadings in the standard specifications consisted of separate two or three axle truck loads and a separate uniform lane load combined with one or two concentrated loads, which differed in magnitude depending on whether the lane load was applied to maximize the moment or the shear. A new separate design live load was also adopted for fatigue design, 
which was largely based on the fatigue design load initially proposed in a 1989 guide specification for fatigue design. That is an HS20 truck with a fixed 30-foot rear axle spacing placed in a single lane. Significantly revised live load distribution factors were also incorporated, which were initially developed in NCHRP Project 12-26. These new live load models and revised distribution factors will be discussed in much greater detail in session number four. The empirical deck design method originally incorporated in the Ontario Highway Bridge Design Code and which assumes that the deck slab resists the effects of concentrated wheel loads through internal arching action rather than flexure was also incorporated as an alternative design approach for concrete decks when certain specified conditions are met. Limit space design provisions were included for foundation design for the very first time. The new specification also included greatly expanded coverage on structural analysis, hydraulics, scour, bridge railings, and ship collision. This list is certainly not exhaustive, but it gives you some flavor of the significant changes and advancements that were incorporated within the new specification. Since the release of the first edition of the LRFD specification in 1994, six subsequent editions have been released in the years shown. The latest edition is the seventh edition released in 2014. The fourth edition released in 2007 was particularly significant in that this was the last SI units version of the specification that was released. All subsequent editions are available in customary U.S. units only. Also recall that up until 2007, bridge engineers had a choice of two specifications to guide their designs, the long-standing standard specifications and the newly adopted LRFD specifications. However, in 2007, the 17th and final edition of the standard specifications, dated 2002, was officially sunsetted by AASHTO in favor of the new LRF LRFD specifications for all projects starting preliminary design after October 1, 2007. While the 17th edition of the standard specs is still available from AASHTO, the standard specs are no longer maintained and are no longer used for the design of new bridges. Of particular importance to the steel bridge industry was a significant technological advancement introduced in the 2005 interims to the third edition of the LRFD specification. In the late 1990s, the FHWA initiated a large curved steel bridge research program, or CSBRP, to experimentally study the behavior of horizontally steel curved steel eye girder bridges with the intent of gaining an improved theoretical understanding of their behavior. The CSBRP represented an experimental program of historical significance, with the test conducted as part of that project representing some of the largest indoor civil engineering related structural tests ever undertaken. The unique concept of utilizing a full-size three-girder bridge as a test frame to test multiple horizontally curved eye girder components was introduced. Full-size components were tested to failure as part of a structure that remained elastic and reusable. This ensured for the first time that realistic boundary conditions would be provided for curved girder component testing. The results from the CSBRP component tests spurred the introduction into the specifications of the so-called one-third rule equations to predict the resistance of eye girder flanges subject to combined major axis and lateral bending stresses. This significant development and simplification allowed for the historical unification for the first time of the design provisions for straight and horizontally curved steel eye and box girder bridges in the 2005 interims under NCHRP Project 12-52. From this point forward, no longer were separate guide specifications for the design of curved steel bridges necessary. Now we will move on and talk a little bit about the maintenance of the Ashdo specifications. 
The AASHTO Subcommittee on Bridges and Structures is composed of 20 technical committees, T1 through T20, that are responsible for the upkeep and maintenance of the AASHTO bridge specifications. This slide shows technical committees T1 through T10. Each committee is responsible for one or more sections of the design specification, or in some cases for one of the other bridge-related specifications that will be mentioned shortly. Each of the committees is typically chaired by one of the state bridge engineers, and each committee is composed of from about eight to 15 other state bridge engineers or their representatives, with one of the engineers serving as the vice chair. Each committee usually has an ex officio member from the FHWA and potentially one of the other non-voting associate members of AASHTO. Technical committees T11 through T20 are shown on this slide. The technical committee for structural steel design T14 is highlighted. Technical committees typically meet or conference at least twice a year to review and discuss proposed revisions to the specifications. These revisions may be proposed by the state or by invited researchers, industry members, or consultants. Formal ballot items are drafted containing the proposed revisions. In addition to the proposed change, each ballot item contains a background discussion, a description of other affected articles in the specification, if any, a description of the anticipated effect of the change on bridges, and a listing of any references. Drafting of the ballot items may re require one or more iterations before the committee votes on whether or not to have the ballot item placed on the agenda of the annual meeting of the AASHTO Subcommittee on Bridges and Structures. The ballot items from all of the committees are then assembled and placed on a members-only portal about eight, four months prior to the annual meeting for review and comment by the membership. The public is not invited to comment. Responses to the comments are generated and revisions to the items are made as necessary. The committees then all assemble one final time at the annual meeting prior to the formal meeting of all the members to review the ballot items one last time and make any last minute changes prior to voting. Items may even be withdrawn at this stage if necessary. Finally, at the formal meeting, the chair of each committee in turn presents their agenda items to the full assembled membership. Motions are made to move the items to ballot and the item must be approved by two thirds of the voting members in order to pass. Once approved, annual interim specifications are typically published and are all then incorporated into the next edition of the specification. It should be noted that AASHTO will be moving to a new three-year printing cycle after the eighth edition LRFD specification is released in 2017, with no published interim specifications in between. Now let's briefly review some other important bridge-related specifications of note. The AASHTO LRFD bridge construction specifications are a separate volume providing special provisions related to the construction of the bridge that can be adopted in individual state specifications. ASTM International is the international standards organization that develops and publishes voluntary consensus standards for a wide range of materials, products, and services. For example, the ASTM A709 specification is the basic material standard for steels used in bridges. AASHTO has their own set of material specifications that basically parallel many of the ASTM specifications, but allow AASHTO to incorporate their own special provisions if desired. The AASHTO material specifications have an M designation in front of the specification number. Thus, the AASHTO M270 specification is essentially the parallel equivalent of the ASTM A709 specification for bridge steels, but typically lags behind a couple of versions. The American Welding Society, or AWS, publishes a joint bridge welding code with AASHTO endorsement. The AASHTO Manual for Bridge Evaluation offers assistance to bridge owners at all phases of bridge inspection and load rating and establishes inspection procedures and evaluation practices 
that meet the national bridge inspection standards. A separate LRFD spec is available that addresses the design of movable highway bridges, including bascule span, swing span, and vertical lift bridges. A guide spec is available as an alternate to the seismic design procedures included in the main LRFD bridge specs. The NSBA Steel Bridge Collaboration develops and publishes voluntary consensus documents and suggested standards in a joint effort with AASHTO to unify some of the diverse requirements governing, governing steel bridge construction. These informative documents are available for free download from AASHTO. And finally, the individual states typically have their own LRFD design and construction specifications, which generally follow AASHTO, but allow the states to modify certain provisions if desired to best suit their individual practices. Let's now move on and discuss the evolution of the various specification design methodologies from the traditional allowable stress design approach used for many years to the two limit state design approaches, load factor design and load and resistance factor design. From the inception of the standard specifications until 1971, the loan design philosophy embedded within the specifications was known as allowable stress design or ASD. This design approach has also been referred to as working stress design or service load design. Allowable stress design establishes allowable stresses as a function of a given member or component's load carrying capacity, R sub n. The allowable stresses are determined by dividing R sub n by a factor of safety. The factors of safety were established based on judgment and experience to cover the uncertainties in the loading, material, methods of analysis, and quality of construction. In the method, the sum of the calculated unfactored or service load stresses due to dead and live load must not exceed the prescribed allowable stresses. ASD has an inherent simplicity which has led to its long time use. However, since the factor of safety is based on judgment and experience, no consistent measure of risk or the margin of safety can be determined using this design method. Another limitation of allowable stress design is that it does not recognize the variable predictability of certain load types, such as dead load and vehicular live loads. To illustrate, the equation shown here is the basic Ashto ASD equation for checking the tensile stress acting on the gross section of a flexural member. The sum of the dead and live load flexural stresses is limited to an allowable stress of 0.55 Fy, where Fy is the yield strength of the steel. The factor of safety in this case is 1.82, or 1 over 0.55. Rearranging this equation illustrates that in checking the strength of the member for flexure in Ashto ASD, a constant load factor of 1.82 is effectively applied to both the dead and live load flexural stresses. This does not reflect the fact that the dead loads are known with more certainty. This results in a widely varying margin of safety for live loads with span length. ASD provides a much larger margin of safety for live loads in longer spans because the dead load is much larger in longer spans. Therefore, greater consistency was needed in determining the maximum live load carrying capacities of steel bridges. As discussed previously, the load factor design methodology was introduced into the ASHO standard specifications in the 1971 interim specifications as an alternative design procedure to ASD for steel structures. In LFD, the maximum strength of a member, R sub n, is equated to the strength required to resist the various forces to which the member will be subjected. The maximum strength, R sub n, on the right-hand side of the basic equation is decreased by a factor phi to allow for uncertainties in the strength of a section, and the load effects on the left-hand side of the basic equation are increased by suitable load factors intended to offset uncertainties in their magnitude and application. 
The load factor gamma is included on the left-hand side to allow for uncertainty concerning the load analysis and other overall effects. Different load factors, beta sub DL and beta sub LL, are also applied to the dead and live load force effects, respectively. Beta sub DL is to allow for possible increases in the dead load, and beta sub LL is to allow for possible overloads. Thus, some of the inherent advantages of LFD over ASD are that it accounts for the variable predictability of various load types uncertainty in the load analysis, and also the variability in material strength. Since different load factors are applied to the dead and live loads, it also provides for greater consistency in determining the maximum live load carrying capacities of steel bridges across all span ranges. A limitation of LFD is that all these factors were essentially arrived at based on engineering judgment, as were the safety factors in ASD. Thus, there was still no quantitative me measure of the risk or margin of safety provided. In the basic strength equation in LFD, the strength factor phi again allowed for uncertainties in the calculation of the strength of a section and the con consequences of failure of an element. A uniform value of phi equal to 1.0 was selected for members subject to flexure, shear, or axial tension on the gross section, which is reasonable because the maximum strength equations for these actions in LFD represented the lower bounds of the test data. Lower values of phi were adopted for compression members to ensure a larger margin for structural integrity due to the greater consequences of failure of these members and for connections to reflect the accepted philosophy that the strength be limited by the main members rather than by the connections. The load factor beta sub DL was taken as 1.0 on the assumption that the designer would allow for future additions to the dead load. The load factor beta sub LL was taken as 5 thirds or 1.67 to represent overloads, whether authorized, unauthorized, or accidental. For H20 and HS20 live loadings, the factor of 5 thirds is approximately equivalent to a double live load or about 150 kips placed in one lane of the bridge with no other vehicles on the structure. For loads less than H20, a load factor of 2.2 was specified. The distinction between the HS20 and H20 live loadings in the standard specifications was that the HS20 truck loading represented a 72 kip three axle truck with a rear axle spacing bearing between 14 and 30 feet, while the H20 truck loading represented a smaller 40 kip two axle truck with a fixed axle spacing of 14 feet. The load factor gamma again allowed for uncertainty in the load analysis and other overall effects. Let's now explore the derivation of the load factor gamma. For member design for flexure and shear, if the uniform strength factor phi is shifted to the load side of the basic strength equation, all sources of uncertainty, except for allowances for future increases in dead load and for overloads, are represented by the term gamma over phi. This term, together with the load factors beta sub DL and beta sub LL, establish the margin of safety for load factor design. To establish the value of gamma over phi for member design, the committee called on past experience. It was known that, <coughs> it was known that the safety of, of allowable stress designs had proven adequate, but that the live load margin of safety was not constant. The minimum margin of safety in ASD was associated with short spans. Therefore, it was decided that in order to provide safe and economical designs in LFD, a value of gamma over phi would be selected that would give the same section by ASD and LFD for a relatively short, non-composite, simple span bridge. It was determined that this occurred at a span of around 40 feet, when gamma over phi was taken equal to 1.25. As the span length increased beyond 40 feet, LFD required a smaller section than ASD, which satisfied the economic objective. 
Gamma over phi of 1.25 also provided the same minimum level of safety for both ASD and LFD. As the span length increased, the margin of safety increased slightly in LFD, which satisfied the safety objective, and at the same time, the live load margin of safety was more nearly constant than in ASD. Later, it was decided by ASHO to conservatively increase the value of gamma over phi to 1.3, which resulted in the final LFD design equation for strength. The final net load factors for so-called group one loading were 1.3 on dead load and 2.17, or 1.3 times 5 thirds, on live load. Other group load combinations were then developed to include other load types in combination with dead and live load when checking for strength. In LFD, the question was then asked as to what was really important in order to provide adequate serviceability under normal traffic loads or service loads. At the service load level in LFD, which represented the dead load plus normal truck traffic, a load factor of one was applied to the loads. At this load level, LFD was only concerned with live load stress ranges to limit fatigue damage and limiting live load deflections. It was felt that if the design was adequate for fatigue and deflection under normal traffic loads, the maximum stresses due to these loads, which is what was computed in ASD, was of little real significance. LFD also specified an overload level, which represented the dead load plus occasional heavy vehicles, for example, example, a special permit vehicle. At this load level, the concern was with limiting any permanent deformations that might occur in the member due to localized yielding of the steel to ensure a smooth ride after passage of these heavy vehicles. It was at this load level that the maximum stresses in the member were limited in LFD to indirectly satisfy this performance requirement. The stress limits were set at 0.95 FY for composite sections and 0.8 FY for non-composite sections based on the results from the ASHO road test, as discussed previously. Slip in bolted connections was also to be prevented at the overload level to help limit permanent deformations. The maximum design load discussed previously was then used to check, ensure an adequate level of safety or strength. The single performance requirement at this load level was that the bridge be able to safely resist a few passages of exceptional heavy overloads in an extreme emergency, with some level of damage expected. In essence, the maximum design load represented a hypothetical vehicle used in design to provide a factor of safety against extreme overloads. The strength reduction factor phi was again generally taken as 1.0 except for compression members and connections. The load and resistance factor design methodology, or LRFD, was adopted by ASHTO in 1993 as the first calibrated probability-based bridge design specification in the U.S. The basic LRFD design equation appears to be very similar in format to the basic design equation for load factor design with uncertainties accounted for on both sides of the inequality. That is, different load factors gamma are applied to the dead and live loads on the left-hand side of the equation to account for their variable predictability, and a resistance factor phi is applied to the nominal resistance R sub n of a member or component on the right-hand side of the equation. Thus, the method can be seen as a logical extension of LFD. A significant advantage inherent in LRFD, however, is that instead of arriving at sets of load and resistance factors based on judgment and experience, these factors are instead determined from a statistical calibration process based on the theories of probability and reliability in attempt to rationally achieve a more uniform level of reliability or margin of safety across all bridge types and all materials. It was decided that the calibration process would target a quantity known as the reliability index, which is somewhat but not directly relatable to the probability of failure, and gives the designer some estimate of the probability of meeting or exceeding the design criteria during the design life. 
The calibration process will be used to statistically select combinations of load and resistance factors to achieve the target reliability index. This calibration is carried out by the code writers. The user of the specification simply applies the resulting load and resistance factors, and no prior knowledge of statistics or reliability theory is required. In LRFD, limit states are formalized, specifically defined, and made of equal import importance in that anyone can control the design or evaluation. The consequences of exceeding the various limit states can be very different, but these differences can be reflected in the load and resistance factors. LRFD also introduces the concept of a load modifier, eta, in the basic equation, which allows the owner to specify a higher or lower level of importance to a particular bridge based on its ductility characteristics, level of redundancy, and operational importance. Eta is currently the product of three subjective factors between 0.95 and 1.05, reflecting the relative values of these three characteristics. The product must equal or exceed 0.95. For simple illustration, let's assume that both the load and the Q and the resistance R are normal random values with bell-shaped curves representing their respective distributions. The mean values of the load and resistance are shown on the plots with a bar over the Q and the R, along with second values offset slightly from the mean values. These are the nominal values of the load and resistance Q sub n and R sub n, which are the values of each that are actually given in the specification and calculated by the engineer. The ratio of the mean value to the nominal value is called the bias. The objective of the LRFD methodology is to divine, define sets of load and resistance factors which are applied to the nominal values of load and resistance such that the, and not to the mean values, such that the shaded area of overlap of the load and resistance is less than or equal to a value that the code writing body accepts. Here we see a conceptual distribution of the resistance minus the load, combining the curves shown on the previous slide, where the area of overlap is now shown as negative values, that is, values to the left of the origin. In this representation, the mean value of the resistance of the minus the load can be defined as some number of standard deviations <coughs> away from, excuse me, as, as some number of standard deviations beta from the origin. This variable beta is called the reliability index. From probability theory, it is known that if the load and resistance are both normal and random variables, the standard deviation of the difference is given as shown here. From the graph, the reliability index beta can then be defined by this equation, again assuming normal distributions of the data. The process of calibrating the load and resistance factors starts with this equation and the basic design relationship that the factor resistance must be greater than or equal to the sum of the factor loads. Using that basic relationship and the definition of the bias, lambda, which again is the ratio of the mean to the nominal value, some massaging of this equation eventually results in this solution for the resistance factor phi. There are three unknowns in this equation, phi, beta, and the load factors gamma. The value of the reliability index, beta, must be chosen by the code writing body. Beta can be thought of as an indicator of the fraction of times that a design criterion will be met or exceeded during the design life. Utilizing this simple analogy, a beta of 3.5, which is the value that was selected for the LRFD code, corresponds to a particular design criterion being exceeded only two in 10,000 times during the design life. Once beta is established, load factors may be assumed and the resistance factors calculated. Again, this illustration is a somewhat simplistic representation and description of the actual calibration process that was used since the actual distributions of the load and resistance are not normal and uniform. However, 
it does illustrate the basic underlying concepts that were utilized in arriving at the load and resistance factors given in the LRFD specification to achieve a more uniform value of the chosen reliability index across the bridge inventory. The actual calibration process is described in more detail in NCHRP Report 368. In the calibration process, a database of approximately 200 representative bridges was selected from various regions of the U.S. by requesting sample bridge plans from various states. The sample set represented a full range of materials and design practices as they varied around the country. From this set, a computer simulation of typical bridges was also developed for calculation purposes. The bridges were all designed using the standard specifications. The reliability indices for both shear and moment were calculated for each actual bridge and those developed for the computer simulation. The range of these indices versus span length is shown in the left-hand figure. As expected, a wide range of values was obtained, <clears throat> clustered around a value of around 3.5. Thus, a target reliability index of 3.5 was chosen as indicative of past practice. The reliability indices were then recalculated for each of the bridges using the LRFD specifications and the proposed new load models, load factors, and resistance factors in those specifications. The plot on the right shows a considerable improvement in the clustering of the reliability indices, indices around the target value of 3.5. This was a direct result of the integration of the load factor, resistance factor, accurate load models, and suitable resistance models in the calibration process. The LRFD specifications were not intended to make a wholesale readjustment in the level of safety inherent in the bridges on the highway system. Rather, they were intended to establish a more uniform margin of safety across that system. At the same time, there was no requirement to make the bridges more uniformly heavier or lighter than those designed using previous specifications. In some cases, bridges designed using LRFD may be slightly heavier than those designed using the standard specs and in other cases they may be somewhat lighter. The important thing to remember is that the resulting margin of safety will be more nearly uniform for all bridge types and structural materials. At the service one load level in LRFD, which represents the dead load plus normal truck traffic, load factors of 1.0 are applied to the loads, as in LFD. However, in LRFD, the dead loads are separated into component dead loads, DC, and the dead load of any wearing surfaces or utilities, DW. At this load level for steel design, LRFD is only concerned with limiting live load deflections. Unlike LFD, two separate load combinations, fatigue 1 and fatigue 2, are specified to limit fatigue damage. In these load combinations, a load factor of either 1.5 or 0.75 is applied to the load effects from the special fatigue load placed in a single lane, depending on whether a particular detail is to be checked for finite life or infinite life. Equivalent to the overload level in LFD is the service 2 load level in LRFD which again represents the dead load plus occasional heavy vehicles, for example, a special permit vehicle. At this load level, the concern is again with limiting any permanent deformations that might occur in the member due to localized yielding of the steel. The stress limits for service two are similarly set at 0.95 FY for composite sections and 0.8 FY for non-composite sections. Slip in bolted connections is also to be prevented at the service 2 load level to help limit permanent deformations. The basic strength 1 load combination in LRFD is then used to ensure an adequate level of safety or strength under dead and live load alone. Other group load combinations that include other load, uh, other load types excuse me, in combination with dead and live load are also specified for checking strength. Note that the live load factors of 1.3 and 1.75 in the service 2 and strength 1 load combinations are significantly less than the corresponding live load factors of 5 thirds 
and 2.17 that we saw earlier for load factor design. This is because the HL93 live load model in LRFD combining both truck and lane loading produces generally larger live load effects than the previous H and HS loadings given in the standard specifications, which applied the truck and lane loadings separately. And so the net factor live load effects are generally about the same in each method. Shown here is a partial listing of the various resistance factors, phi, that are to be applied to the nominal resistance for various actions and components in steel structures at the strength limit state, as specified in Article 6542 of the AASHTO LRFD spec. The resistance factors for flexure and shear that resulted from the calibration process are both equal to 1. Other resistance factors, for example, for compression members and connections, are generally less than 1. These resistance factors were generally set at a value that is 0.05 higher than the corresponding values in the AISC specification. We will now close this portion of the session with a brief comparison of the AISC specification for the design of structural steel buildings and the AASHTO specification for bridge design. In general, the latest versions of the AISC and AASHTO specifications are generally in step with each other for the most part. The nominal resistance equations predicting the strength of various steel members are generally in agreement with a few minor exceptions. The AISC specification supports, supports both the allowable stress design and load and resistance factor design methodologies for strength design. There is greater emphasis on non-composite roll beam design, that is, sections with more compact webs, and less emphasis on moving loads and fatigue design in the AISC specification. <coughs> the AASHTO specification supports the LRFD design methodology only. There is greater emphasis on composite plate girder design, that is, on design of composite sections with more slender webs. Singly symmetric and hybrid sections are also more commonly found in bridges. And obviously, there is greater emphasis on moving loads and fatigue design in the AASHTO specification. Although the basic notation used is somewhat different in the two specifications, sections are typically classified using the same basic terminology. For example, when it comes to web slenderness, sections are classified in both specifications for flexural design as either compact web sections, non-compact web sections, or slender web sections. D sub CP is defined in the AASHTO specification as the depth of the web and compression at the plastic moment, which is referred to as H sub P in the AISC specification. D sub C is defined in the AASHTO specification as the elastic depth of the web and compression, which is referred to as H sub C in the AISC specification. The lambda terms defining the limiting slenderness values for each type of section are essentially the same in each specification and will be shown on the next slide. The notation for the lambda value shown here is the notation given in the AASHTO specification. The terms lambda sub p and lambda sub r are used instead in the AISC specification. The limiting slenderness delineating a compact web section from a non-compact web section is defined in both specifications by the top equation. The limit depends on the shape factor, or ratio of the plastic moment m sub p to the yield moment m sub y. For Fy equal to 50 KSI, the value of lambda is presented in the table underneath this equation for shape factors of 1.12 and 1.3. The value of 1.12 is the typical shape factor for a non-composite, doubly symmetric roll beam section. Compact web sections are typically rolled beam sections or welded sections of similar proportion, which are often singly symmetric. The limiting slenderness delineating a non-compact web section from a slender web section is defined in both specifications by the second equation. The value of this limiting slenderness shown in the bottom table is for Fy equal to 50 KSI. <coughs> 
Similar comparisons can be made between specifications for the classification of sections for defining the local buckling behavior of flanges and compression, and for the classification of unbraced lengths for defining the lateral torsional buckling behavior of the beam or girder in between brace points. These behaviors, local buckling and lateral torsional buckling, will all be discussed in greater detail in Lesson 6. The majority of steel sections in buildings are either compact web or non-compact web sections. The majority of steel girder sections in bridges are slender web sections. However, a steel beam or girder does not know whether it is in a building or a bridge. Therefore, it obviously makes some sense that the equations defining the basic behavior of a steel section should be essentially the same in both specifications, with the primary differences simply being in the basic notation used to define some of the terms in the equations and in the basic organization of each specification. For those of you that are more familiar with the organization and notation of the AISC specification, which is what is most often primarily taught in schools, you should not feel intimidated by the AASHTO specification. Once you realize that the equations defining the basic behavior of steel beams and girders are essentially the same, it simply becomes a matter of familiarizing yourself with the organization and notation of the AASHTO spec and where the various equations are located, which will come with experience. In fact, Appendix C to Section 6 of the AASHTO spec on steel structures contains some detailed flowcharts to help you get started and to guide you through section six of the specification in order to more easily familiarize yourself with the organization of the steel design provisions at each limit state. The final topic to be covered in session two presents an overview of section six of the AASHTO LRFD specification. The four limit states in LRFD and the associated behaviors of concern at each limit state for different types of members used in steel bridges will then be discussed. Important design issues related to skewed and horizontally curved steel bridges will also be briefly highlighted. The AASHTO LRFD specifications are divided up into the 15 sections shown here, covering all facets of the design of the bridge super and substructures. Two sections are highlighted, Section 6 on the design of steel structure and Section 4 on structural analysis and evaluation. The previous standard specifications did not include any chapters or sections on structural analysis. This was an, a new development in the LRFD specifications. In Session 1 of the course, you learned about the various methods of analysis. Section 4 of the AASHTO LRFD spec covers all of these methods including approximate methods of analysis, which typically are line girder analysis methods that utilize live load distribution factors computed either from empirical formulas, such as the one shown here, or from statics to distribute the live loads to the individual girders. Section 4 also provides coverage on more refined methods of analysis, which are seeing increased usage, particularly for the design of more complex steel bridges such as horizontally curved bridges and bridges with significant skew. Included is coverage on 2D refined methods of analysis, such as traditional grid models and the so-called plate and eccentric meat beam models described in session one, and 3D refined methods of analysis. 2D refined methods of analysis are generally less complex and expensive than 3D refined methods and are generally sufficient for reasonably regular span or framing arrangements, moderate spans and skews, and or large radii. The 3D finite element method should be considered for irregular span or framing arrangements, long spans, severe skew, and or small radii. A significant advantage of 3D models is that force effects in the individual members can be captured more directly since each member is usually explicitly modeled. Approximations must typically be made in 2D models to model the cross frames and the concrete deck unless a plate and eccentric beam model is utilized in which the deck is modeled with shell elements that are offset from the grid. Recent advancements have been incorporated within Section 4 that should help to bring the results from 2D models closer to those obtained from more complex 3D models. <laughs> 
Section 6 of the AASHTO LRFD specifications on steel structures is divided up into the 16 sections shown here. Section 6 covers the design of steel components, splices, and connections for straight or horizontally curved girder structures, frames, trusses, and arches. The LRFD provisions have no span limit. Provisions for proportioning main elements are generally grouped by structural action. That is, provisions are grouped for the design of tension members, compression members, and flexural members. Later sessions will focus on some of these articles and design provisions in greater detail. In this particular section, session, we are going to focus on Article 6.5 and the four limit states that are specified in LRFD, along with the various behaviors of concern in general at each limit state for members in steel bridge superstructures. A limit state is defined as a condition in which a component or structure becomes unfit for service and is judged to be no longer useful for its intended function or to be unsafe. The LRFD specifications require the examination of several load combinations corresponding to some or all of four limit states. The service limit state, fatigue and fracture limit state, strength, and extreme event limit states. Service limit states are restrictions on stress, deformation, and crack width under regular service conditions. They are intended to allow the bridge to perform acceptably over its regular service life and prevent objectionable permanent deformations due to severe traffic loadings that would impair rideability. Limits on live load deflection can be traced back to the railway specifications of the late 1800s. As mentioned previously, the first specified live load deflection limit for steel highway bridges in the U.S. of span 800, over 800 was introduced in the 1941 ASHO specification and has remained unchanged since that time. In the early 1960s, an additional limit of span over 1,000 was introduced on steel bridges with both pedestrian and vehicular loads as a result of isolated concerns related to human response. Although these suggested limits have been in the specification for quite some time, there is no evidence of structural damage that can be attributed directly to excessive live load deflections. Although there are no provisions for checking dead load deflections, the engineer is wise to consider vertical deflection of the steel and its potential effects during the various stages of construction of the bridge. As we have already discussed, flange stresses are limited under the service two load combination to control permanent deformations in the steel girder spans at the service limit state. A web bend buckling check is also specified under this load combination to control transverse displacements in the compression zone of the web. 1% longitudinal deck reinforcement is also to be provided in regions where the deck is subject to significant tension under the service two load combination in order to control deck cracking at the service limit state. The second limit state is the fatigue and fracture limit state. The fatigue limit state is restrictions on stress range under regular service conditions reflecting the expected number of stress range cycles as a result of a single design truck. The fatigue limit state is to be called for so-called load-induced fatigue, which is defined as fatigue effects due to the in-plane stresses for which components and details are explicitly designed. For load-induced fatigue, live load stress ranges in the base metal due to the passage of a single fatigue design truck are limited to the specified nominal fatigue resistance of a particular detail based on its detail category classification and the number of cycles that detail is expected to be subjected to over its fatigue design life. The fatigue limit state is also to be checked for so-called distortion-induced fatigue, which is defined as fatigue effects due to secondary stresses not normally quantified in the typical analysis and design of a bridge. These are typically out-of-plane stresses occurring in small gaps at welded details that are magnified when proper attachment of connection plates supporting transverse members is not made to the flanges. These out-of-plane stresses are not readily computed using normal analysis procedures. 
Instead, detailing practices are specified in the LRFD specifications that require a positive attachment of the connection plates to the flanges to preclude the possibility of the distortion-induced fatigue. The fracture limit state is defined as a set of material toughness requirements of the AASHTO material specifications. Fracture toughness is defined as the measure of the ability of a structural material or element to absorb energy without fracture. Fracture toughness is generally determined by the so-called Sharpie V-notch test, in which a small bending specimen with a machine notch is impacted by a hammer at high strain rates, and the energy required to initiate fracture in the specimen is measured. The maximum height the pendulum rises after impact indicates the amount of energy absorbed in foot-pounds. The fatigue and fracture limit states are intended to limit crack growth under repetitive loads to prevent fracture during the design life of the bridge. These limit states will be discussed further in session eight. Strength limit states are intended to ensure that strength and stability, both local and global, are provided to resist the statistically significant load combinations that a bridge will experience over its design life. Extensive distress and structural damage may potentially occur at the strength limit state, but overall structural integrity is expected to be maintained. For members subject to axial tension at the strength limit state, checks are made to ensure that gross section yielding occurs prior to fracture on the net section through any holes that may be provided in the member. Members subject to axial compression are checked at the strength limit state for overall column buckling based on the applicable buckling modes of flexural buckling, torsional buckling, or flexural torsional buckling, depending on the symmetry of the cross section and the length of the member. The effect of potential local buckling of any slender elements in the cross section on the overall column buckling resistance is also considered. Tension flanges and continuously braced flanges of flexural members with slender webs are checked for nominal yielding at the strength limit state. Compression flanges of flexural members that are discreetly braced are checked for flange local buckling, which depends on the slenderness of the compression flange. They are also checked for lateral torsional buckling, which depends on the spacing between the cross frames. Narrow eye girder bridge units with three or fewer girders are also checked for global lateral torsional buckling of the entire system when in their non-composite condition during the deck placement. The shear resistance of girder webs is also checked at the strength limit state. Transverse stiffeners on slender webs are spaced to take advantage of the post-buckling shear resistance due to tension field action that is available at the strength limit state. The design of flexural members for these limit states will be covered in greater detail in session six. And finally, the extreme event limit states are intended to ensure the structural survival of a bridge during a major earthquake or when collided by a vessel, vehicle, or ice flow, or where the foundation is subject to the scour which would accompany a flood of extreme recurrence, usually considered to be 500 years. Extreme event limit states are considered to be unique occurrences whose return period is significantly greater than the design life of the bridge. To wrap up this session, we will touch briefly now on some general issues of concern related to the behavior of skewed and horizontally curved steel bridges, which will be examined in much greater detail later on in session seven of the course. Skewed supports allow the bridge to be matched to underpassing roads or streams. They also allow for reduced girder span lengths and bridge deck area, as well as reduced girder depths. However, they are not without their design and construction challenges. Bridges with significant skew are subject to large differential deflections between the girders, since the cross frames connect to different points along the span of each girder, as you see here. As a result, the girders must twist to maintain rotational continuity with the rigid truss-like cross frames. 
The twisting results in torsion in the girders, and the torsion causes flange lateral bending stresses, which are exacerbated whenever the cross frame lines are discontinuous across the width of the bridge. The twisting also causes issues that must be considered in the detailing and fit-up of the cross frames to achieve the desired geometry in the field during construction. Larger than normal cross frame forces can also be generated in skewed, bridge, skewed bridges whenever stiff transverse load paths are provided. For example, whenever cross frames normal to the girders are framed directly into the bearings along the skewed support line. Skewed bridges are also subject to unique thermal movements, which leads to challenges in determining the bearing orientation and restraints. Skewed bridges can also be more susceptible to uplift than straight right bridges. Curved steel girder bridges have been designed and built in the U.S. since the 1950s. Today, they represent a significant percentage of the total steel bridge market. However, they are also not without their design and construction challenges. The bridge cross-section in horizontally curved bridges is subjected to significant internal torsional moments due to the fact that the resultant of the bridge vertical loads within the spans has an eccentricity relative to a straight cord drawn between the supports. The predominant resistance to the internal torsion is developed by interconnecting the girders across the entire bridge width by the cross frames. The torsion, although resulting from a different source than in skewed bridges, again produces flange lateral bending stresses that must be considered. The twisting similarly causes issues that must be considered in the detailing and fit up of the cross frames. There is typically additional labor and material costs involved in curbing the flanges and fabricating the girders. Greater costs are also typically required in handling, shipping, and erection of the structural steel. The, de the design time for curved girders is slightly more than for straight girders, and there is general, generally greater complexity in construction, since erection of curved girder bridges typically requires the use of more temporary supports. Bracing members in curved bridges typically carry more significant design loads than comparable straight bridges, since they provide the primary resistance to the internal torsion. And curved bridges may also be more susceptible to uplift than straight right bridges. Although they do provide challenges, skewed and curved steel bridges have been, built, have been successfully designed, fabricated, and constructed for many years and have performed well in service. Again, they will be covered in greater detail later on in Session 7. This brings us to the end of Session 2 of this introductory course on steel bridge design, which has served as both an introduction to the AASHTO LRFD bridge design specifications and as a lead-in to some of the issues and topics that are to be covered in more detail in the sessions that follow. In this session, we have covered the historical background and evolution of the AASHTO bridge design specs. The major improvements to the specifications at each step were highlighted, along with the processes and procedures that are employed to update and maintain the specifications. Other bridge specifications of note were also mentioned. Then we covered the evolution of the various design methodologies in the AASHTO specifications, from the earlier allowable stress design and load factor design methodologies up to the present-day load and resistance factor design methodology. A basic comparison of the AISC and AASHTO design specifications was then made. Finally, we completed a broad overview of the present-day LRFD specifications, primarily focused on Section 6 of the specification on steel structures. The various limit states and the associated behaviors of concern at each limit state for different types of members used in steel bridges were discussed. Important design issues related to skewed and horizontally curved steel bridges were also briefly reviewed. Thank you for your attention. We hope that you have found this session to be both interesting and informative. I will now turn it over to the moderator to see if there are any questions. Okay, thank you, Mike. Um, I know we ran a little bit long today, so we'll just try to answer a few questions as quickly as we can. Um, I'm going to take us to slide 17, um, around 
think around this point in the presentation, you started referring to composite construction. Could you explain what composite construction is? Uh, yes, composite construction is a, uh, when the steel and the concrete are connected to act together. And they're generally connected, the concrete deck is generally connected to the steel section with uh, so-called shear connectors, which are generally shear studs that prevent slip between the concrete and the steel and ensure a linear distribution of the strain uh, through the depth of the composite section. So if you have the stud shear connectors, we can take advantage of that in design and include the concrete acting with the steel. Okay, thank you, Mike. Uh, the next question, uh, this participant was wondering why there are AASHTO material specs and ASTM specs, and uh, basically what's the <laughs> distinction between the two? Okay, that's a, that's a good question. I guess uh, a lot of the fabricators would like to see the AASHTO material specs kind of go away, I think. They would like to just see the ASTM, because generally the AASHTO material specs lag behind the ASTM specs. And so ASTM really sets the standards. And then AASHTO has their own specs so they can sort of pick and choose what they want to, what they want to accept and any special provisions they want to include. So it depends on the state as to which, uh, which specifications they'll generally accept, the individual states. But the ASTM is really the governing body for the materials. Okay, thank you. Um, the next few questions have to do with the LFD uh, methodology. Could you explain again the primary difference between LFD and LRFD? Well, in many ways they're very similar. They have different load factors applied to the dead and live loads, uh, which is similar, uh, to recognize the variable predictability of both of those loads. Uh, the main difference is that the load factors and load factor design were selected based on judgment and people in a smoke-filled room, if you will. Uh, good judgment, use good judgment to come up with the load and resistance factors, whereas in LRFD, it was more of a scientific probability-based approach to arrive at the factors. To, and the goal, again, was to try and achieve a more uniform margin of safety than was... Uh, when it is possible in load factor design using these factors based on judgment and experience. And the one graph there showed the, uh, you know, the improved clustering around the reliability index of 3.5 with the LRFD methodology. Again, the goal was not to try and come up with a heavier bridge or a lighter bridge in LRFD than the previous methods, and it was more to assure a more uniform margin of safety for all bridges and material types than uh, LFD and ASD. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next question, for LFD, did the live load include an impact factor? Uh, yeah, I really didn't get into impact too much, but uh, the impact factor is separate in both LRFD and in LFD. In LFD, the impact factor was actually a function of the span length. And so the equation was 50 divided by the span length plus 125 was your impact percentage. So the longer your span, the smaller was the impact. In LRFD, they did away with the effect of the span length, and you have a flat value of 33% impact that's applied to the truck load only, uh, truck loading only not to the lane load. So there are, there are impact factors in both specifications. We didn't get into it here. They're not really part of the load. They're treated separately, but they are both applied to the live load. And in LFD, it was a function of the span length. In LRFD, it's a flat percentage that's independent of the span length. Okay, thank you, Mike. And I think we have time for one last question. Okay. Uh, when doing a bridge rehab or winding on an existing bridge designed with LFD, in your opinion, which design spec should be used for the new components? <laughs> well, I guess to me it would make sense to use the same spec that, we, that was used to uh, design the bridge originally, but many states now, I think, require those things, widenings and so forth, to be done by LRFD. 
And so that, uh, that obviously adds some additional complexity because the original bridge was designed for a different live loading uh, than the widening and so forth. So I guess my, my, the way I would do it is just design the widening or the rehab for the, uh, L, for the LRFD specification if that's what they require. And then you might have to go back and rate the entire bridge when you're done to see how it, how it uh, all shakes out. So that's a complex. That's a complicated, complicated question. Uh, it probably depends on the state how they want you to do it. Okay. Thank you, Mike. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, that's all the time we have for questions tonight. If your question did not get answered, we will work with the speaker to send you your answers um, by email. <laughs>